Do you want to see some crazy shit? Do you want to see a factory explosion propel a man to space? Or how about a classroom breaking out into a shootout? Or how about something like this? <laughs> well, do I have the move for you? That being Forbidden Zone, a cheap, directionless, badly acted mess, which also happens to be a great film. In the late 70s, the avant-garde theater troupe The Mystic Knights of the Young Boinko was about to disband, with the group's founder and director Richard Elfman wanting to transition into filmmaking. He decided that for his debut film he would try to capture the kind of absurd and off-the-wall theater performances he had done with his old troupe. The result is one of the most bizarre and entertaining musicals ever put on film, a demanded thrill ride through a world where adults play children, where people jump into insane musical performances with little to no transition, where one moment you are watching what looks like a cheap theater production, and the next you're looking at Monty Python-esque animations. The intention behind the whole movie seems to be this, shock and confound the audience at all costs. A cohesive narrative, character arcs, plot, basic logic, any rules in general. You're really out to lunch. All of that is of no concern, as the point of a pitten zone is the spectacle. There is next to no narrative through line, the story often jumping from one non sequitur to another. Instead, it's a bunch of musical acts strung together by a plot as thin as the paper which the set was made of, all serving the spectacle of the film. The writer seemed more focused on throwing in as many wacky and creative ideas into the film as possible, rather than making a cohesive narrative. Thus, the story is without bare bones. Beneath the Hercules family home lies the gateway to the sixth dimension, also known as the Forbidden Zone. Characters fall into the gateway, and hijinks ensues. This may sound like a problem, and if it were any other movie, most of what I listed above would be criticisms. But you do not watch Forbidden Zone for its story, you watch it for the spectacle. Plus the film's total disregard for the conventions of storytelling is a part of its charm. With such an approach, the film ran the risk of getting monotonous. Thankfully, the filmmakers keep coming up with more creative ways to confound and shock the audience, be it through editing, animation, special effects, or the film's off-color sense of humor, making the whole experience unpredictable and fresh. That and the short runtime slash fast pace makes it so that you're rarely bored while watching. Seeing clips of the movie, one of the first things that is sure to pop out is the production design. To call it cheap is an understatement. It is almost on par with high school productions, the set designers having had next to no budget. You tell me about your artistic conception of doing all the sets in Forbidden Zone, an yes. integral part of the film. It's very simple. It, it came out of necessity. When you have nothing to work with, you, can, you have to come up with some great ideas to fight that. I mean, to use, to create all your ideas. So the black paper was great, and then we found some cheap of fabrics in trash can or wherever. Oh, with, <laughs> with, 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 with your vast art <laughs> budget that I didn't give you. Yes. But because of those limitations, the filmmakers, specifically lead actress and set designer Marie Pascal Elfman had to get extra creative, building something that looks like if the cabinet of Dr. Calcari was a cheap live action children's show. What makes it work is that there is no attempt to hide how fake the sets are, and a part of the film's humor is the artificiality of it all. Instead of letting their limitations burn them, the filmmakers designed the movie to work because of those limitations, similar to Monty Python's The Holy Grail. And despite their cheapness, some of the sets built for the film looked down are great in an unconventional, quaint sort of way, the love and care that went into making them being clear as day. But what is perhaps the crowning achievement of the film's aesthetics are the beautiful animations made by John Muto. Taking inspiration from Terry Gilliam and the Fleischer brothers, Muto used airbrushes to create the distinct and stylistic animated backgrounds and mixed in still photos of the actors. The result is a series of unique and striking little segments that, despite their brevity, stick in your mind more than anything else in the movie. Another great aspect of the film is its music, and if you look at the cast and crew list, that should come as no surprise, as this was the debut of Danny Elfman as a film composer. Back when the Mystic Knights were still together, they would primarily take classic jazz and cabaret acts and perform them with avant-garde theatrics. Similarly, the movie has the actors either lip-syncing to or doing covers of songs by people like Cap Calloway and Josephine Baker. Along with that, the movie features new tunes that sound like a prototype of what Danny Elfman would do later on when working with directors like Tim Burton, or with his rock band Oingo Boingo, which he formed after the movie. The soundtrack's a joy to listen to, being dark and sinister, while at the same time jolly and playful, working perfectly with the film's style. 
My personal favorite being Danny Elfman's rendition of Minnie the Moocher in the scene where he portrays the devil. Don't worry about your friends, relax, now walk with his hand. The acting is all intentionally bad, Richard Elfman using the actor's lack of skill and experience to his advantage, similar to the works of John Waters. Everyone is over the top and not taking anything seriously, devouring the scenery like it's a buffet, acting like live action cartoons and mental patients. My favorite performance is being Matthew Bright as the Henderson twins, who are the film's comedic highlight, offering up some of the funniest lines and moments, especially Renee. The Queen said she was going to ream us with 20 inch cattle prods, and I'm still waiting! Along with Phil Gordon as Flash, whose dry and nonchalant demeanor just as well with all the craziness going on around him. But there is one performance that stands out amongst them all, Susan Tyrell as Queen Doris, who is genuinely great, bringing the same over the top insanity as the rest of the cast but managing to balance that out with an emotional sincerity that makes you feel for such an absurd character. She has so much bravado and charm that you can't help but be entranced by her, which in my opinion makes her the true star of the film. God bless you, Susu. That's true. This film would be nothing without Susan Terrell. <laughs> and that is Forbidden Zone. Is it pretty? No, sorry. Does it make much sense? No, sorry. Does it have anything when approaching a structure? No, sorry. But is it fun as hell? Uh huh. That, more than anything else, is why you should watch it.